Paranormal King Radio Network. Bringing you the best paranormal hosts and guests. Bringing you the best paranormal shows and features. Playing the top musical artists from around the world. Paranormal King Radio Network. With the best paranormal hosts and guests. The best in paranormal shows and features. Playing the best musical artists from around the world. Paranormal King Radio Network. The paranormal will never be the same. You are listening to Paranormalities and Ponderings with the Casper Paranormal Team. Brought to you by the Paranormal King Radio Network and hosted by Frank Lee. Join us for the next hour as we discuss ghosts, spirits, hauntings, and other worldly phenomena that has yet to be explained in hopes of finding answers. This show is meant to be a resource for those of you who, like us, seek to find answers to the unknown. We hope you find it informative and enjoy the show. Once again, thank you for listening. Hi everybody and welcome to Paranormalities and Ponderings. I'm your host, Frank Lee, and we appreciate you tuning in tonight. Got a great show in store for you, and got a great guest lined up. We have tonight Roger Belt from Half Past Dead Paranormal Investigations, and also from Half Past Dead Paranormal Radio. Roger, how are you tonight? I'm just great. How about yourself? I'm doing excellent. Can't complain a bit, and I've... Glad to have you on the show tonight. I appreciate you coming on. Hello, Cheryl. <laughs> so, um, I'd, um, I I know you've got your show as well, um, the Half Past Dead Paranormal Radio, and the team's doing quite a bit. Um, it's called Half Past Dead Paranormal Radio, the Paranormal and Strange, and we dabble into all kinds of stuff, so... Right, I, I've, I've noticed y'all do cover quite a few topics, uh, not not just with ghosts, but We cover everything. Bigfoot, UFOs, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, and we're going to be getting a little more into legends and mysteries. That's awesome, and, and I like that kind of diversity with the show and with the team as well, because... By definition, paranormal is anything outside of what can be typically explained. Another accent. <laughs> <laughs> That's my southern fried accent, folks. Right. And and for anyone that, that doesn't know, uh, Roger is he, he's one of my neighbors just a little bit to the north of me. So that, um, that will explain his accent and... <laughs> so tonight, um, you got two Southerners on here that like to hunt ghosts. <laughs> and, and I have to say, Roger, Ed, when when I first talked to you about coming on the show, I, I'm going to tell on you a little bit. Um, you gave me the best bio description that anyone has ever given me. And uh, you gonna make a brown man blush? <laughs> that. When 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 I asked Roger about, you, you know, when I when I asked Roger about his bio, 
he said, well, there's not much to it. I'm just an old country. He said, I'm just an old goat that likes to hunt ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was, at that, I, I told him that was the best bio I've ever heard because I have yet to hear anybody come close to one that creative. <laughs> I mean, there's no way to top that. Well, I mean, you know, I'm I'm a country boy. I live down here in West Tennessee, and uh, we're not fancy down here. You know, I, I don't even have all the fancy equipment that, that these high-tech groups have and everything, but you don't really need it. That's right. I'll, I'll agree with that. You know, you know I, would I would I love to have a flare? Yeah, I would, but I'd love to have about five grand I could spend on something else too. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That, that's right. I, you you sound quite a bit like me on that. I I would love to have the money set aside that's that that I can spend and everything on something like that. So so I, I definitely can relate to that. But. You, you know, you're in such a good area because, you know, for for Tennessee, you've got so much history there. There's, you know. There's there's places that, and, and it's on my bucket list, i got to say, you know. Uh, in fact, there's some down there around you that's on my bucket list, like Sloss Furnace and places like that, you know. But uh, it's it's not really about going where everybody's been and all the big places and, you know, making a name or anything like that. You know, I I got in this basically to answer questions for myself and to help people. And so, you know, if I get to go, we did a a hospital up in Fayetteville recently Mm -hmm. and it wasn't, you know, a, a client call like, you know, yeah, come help us. We're having all these problems. No, it's just a, it was a it was the regional hospital and they shut it down and built a new one. And the history of it is basically it was a college from like nineteen oh nine to nineteen twenty five, I think. And then the hospital took it over and tore down some of the original and rebuilt and it's three stories and a basement. And it we didn't get a lot of activity. I was surprised, but uh, I did get one EVP that I that I managed to bring out. It was like a child going, "Ooh!" <laughs> right, and, and I love the fact that you're saying that because you don't hear many teams anymore say, exactly. you know, "We went to this place and we didn't get crap there." <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, see, I, I'm glad that. <laughs> I, I'm glad to hear that for a change. That that is, I you know that is such a nice change of pace. That is one of the things that that always gets me is when people they find out that you are a paranormal investigator and they're like, oh, I always wanted to do that. Let me join up with your team and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and they go on one investigation with you, and if you don't get nothing, they're like, you know, well. Uh, I, I got something to do. I can't go on this next one, you know, or they'll make excuses. And you don't always get something. You know, right. you can't beat that into people's head enough. You don't always get evidence, you know. Now, the majority of the time, I will get, like, like the hospital, I did get one EVP. And usually you'll get one or two EVPs, you know. But you're not going to get, like, an apparition around every corner. And also, you know, people need to realize that ghosts don't, they don't play on cue. If they don't want to show, they're not going to show. That's right. I I agree. And, you know, I I really believe that in a way that that's insulting to them when people go in and expect them to perform on cue. And when they don't, automatically go into provocation. And by getting upset, you know, and yeah. So, so I and Cat in the chat room has a good point. Says they don't perform either, and, and exactly. I agree with that. And, and I have a question from the chat um, from King there, who um, 
who was asking about the big O word, and well, the big O word, right, right, the big O word. That's only three, well, four letters. That <laughs> orbs. <laughs> what What's your take on orbs? You really want me to say that? <laughs> it, I have you, a philosophy. You, you know I'm going to go there. <laughs> I have a philosophy on orbs, and most of the people that know me know my philosophy on orbs. When an orb comes up to my face and says, hey, Raj, I'm an orb entity, then I'll put it down as evidence. <laughs> if it don't, or it don't turn into an apparition in front of my eyes, it's a piece of dust, a bug, what a heavy. Right, <laughs> right. And, and that's, what, um, that's what I've heard quite a few people say is to, you know, in case of orbs, break out the, the orb repellent. And, yeah, there and, you go. You know, they'll show a can of pledge. <laughs> yeah, I never thought of that. So, I'm going to have to do an ad with that on it now, just because you said that. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to work that one up. <laughs> yeah, I know just the person I've seen that one to. Well, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely get that one <laughs> set up. <laughs> <laughs> and here, here it is. We're supposed to be doing a radio show, and me and you are too busy conspiring. That. That's bad. There you go. Yeah. Now, now, everyone listening, you see what happens when a when a couple of country boys from the south get together, right? <laughs> <laughs> but so. no, I, I mean, I, I love uh, what I do, and we we don't do a lot. We're not constantly, you know, out investigating and everything. But that's fine. I do the radio show every week, and you know, when a call comes in or we get a place like the hospital up there, we're off and running, you know, and. Uh, if we get terribly bored, I know where a few good cemeteries are. So, you know, we're, we're never without if we really want to get out and do something. Right, right. And now, um, I, I know that you recently done the hospital. Now, how, how many cases would you say that y'all take on that are like private residences or businesses that yeah. like the help cases? There, around here, there's really not a lot of them. I think most people are scared to admit that they have something like that going on because the first thought that enters their head is, you know, well, if I get somebody to come over here and everything and, you know, the neighbors see it, you know, they're going to think we're nuts. Right. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of slow around here most of the time. Uh, and then every now and then you'll get one that you wish they hadn't called you in the first place <laughs> we read the last one the last residence that we did was one of those mm -hmm. uh and how can i say this without sounding like i'm a nut um uh, our team leader our team founder mm -hmm. who is dusty ward he's a good friend of mine real great guy another one of your southern boys mm -hmm. uh <laughs> we were investigating this place uh, in the next town over from us there. It was kind of a little bit out in the sticks. And it was a double wide. Mm -hmm. Now, when I got there, I walked around and the guy was showing me this, that, and the other thing. We were out in the backyard out by the tree line where he claimed this stuff was going on, right? I turn around and the first thing I see is two telephone poles, one on each side of their trailer with a big transformer on it. Bing! <laughs> exactly. EMF out the, you know, 90% mm -hmm. of what was going on with them was probably from that. But, <laughs> I gotta tell you about the snake. <laughs> okay, uh, and, and, and our founder, like I said, Dusty's a great guy, right? Always willing to do anything to help a client. Right. Well, I was in... I think one of the front rooms I uh, was in there doing some ADP or something and he was in there with <laughs> with the lady that lived there and they were in like the little utility room where the back door is. Mm -hmm. Now up on the shelf and tell me how this this is up on the shelf, right? But up on the shelf is a little tree or it's a tree and wrapped around this tree is a 15 foot invisible anaconda. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did wow. say visible anaconda. Wow. 
okay, she says, it's right around that tree. Well, he's trying to help her out, right? So he reaches up there and he acts like he's grabbing this snake. And he's got his hands like maybe six inches apart, you know. He says, am I getting it? She says, no, uh, it's bigger. So he spreads his hands out. He's, he's showing us how he, demonstrating how he got the snake, right? And that was so hilarious watching him demonstrate how he got the snake and got it out of the house. But anyway, so then he opens his fingers up to about 10 inches apart, right? And he says, have I got it? Yeah. So he unwinds this snake, imaginary snake from around the tree. <laughs> and he's got it. And she says, you don't have it by the head. It's biting you right now. <laughs> Okay, so he moves his hands up a little, like he's doing, moving his hands up a little further. He goes, have I got it? And she's like, yeah. And he goes, open the door. She says, what? He says, open the door. I can't let go of the snake. <laughs> so she opens the door, and he drags this invisible 15-foot anaconda out of the house. Okay, now he's telling her that, <laughs> that he's got the spirit of a dead convict because he worked such a prison. <laughs> and he, he says, all right, convict, kill that snake for her. <laughs> okay, so he says, you ain't got to worry about it. Convicts will kill the snake. It ain't going to come back in your house no more. <laughs> and this was after we after we left the house. We, we stopped up in town at the McDonald's and just kind of pulled over the parking lot. We was all out there talking. We were laughing so hard. And he's demonstrating how he got the snake out of the house, and he, he's doing all the movements and everything. And I laughed so hard I had tears running down my face. This was this was one of those cases that you, you'd rather they hadn't called. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and, and her husband is showing him around, right? Well, they go in the bedroom where supposedly uh, stuff's going on in there. Mm -hmm. So he's showing him spots where things are supposed to be happening and he pulls this drawer up and says this is where we keep all our drugs right <laughs> so so now did the husband see the snake too <laughs> I have to well ask. I don't know if he saw the snake he wasn't in there when she was showing Dusty the snake so I, I don't know what he was doing at that time but it, it was so funny you know I mean in a way I, I was kind of Glad because I needed a good laugh, but in a way I wish they had to call because I could have found something better to do. <laughs> well, it, you know, but at the same time, that you can't find anything much more entertaining than, that is true. That than, is true. than wrestling a 15 foot ghost anaconda. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong here, ghost or no, anacondas live in, in the uh, rainforest where the water is, right? Well, well, I think rainforest in tropical regions of Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> tropical, well, we weren't in a tropical region, I promise. <laughs> right. We'll put lakes up about an hour away and everything. Uh, they, we should have told them, we, we, we'll take it down to the Rupert Lake and turn it loose, you know. And uh, <laughs> That's the humane way to get rid of an invisible snake. Right, <laughs> right, right. As long as the as long as the invisible snake is humanely disposed of, you you don't exactly, want to, exactly. right because you you don't want to get PETA involved or anything like that because that <laughs> you know they they take the way that you treat invisible animals very seriously. <laughs> but anyway, that was one of the more funnier ones that we did, and we did one over there, same town, where. It's a little baby house. Mm -hmm. But now this kept going on and on and on. They kept calling us, you know, you need to come back. we got portals in here, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, the first time we went, uh, we found out that the, the daughter mm -hmm. is gifted. Okay? Mm -hmm. And now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anybody can't be. Right. Uh, you know, I, I have friends that, that are psychic mediums that I believe in wholeheartedly. Cheryl's one of them. But, uh, <laughs> and this girl, I believe she might have actually had a little bit of something going on. But, where it started getting funnier and funnier is when you find out that everybody in the house was gifted. Oh, wow. And they weren't, uh, how do I say this? Uh, the the her mother, her daddy, 
and her stepmother. So the stepmother, and, and, and it started getting real funny because she said, it, you know, this was the first time we, we went over there. She, they were all gifted, and, you know, this all this was going on. And we, um, with the help of the daughter and everything, crossed all these ghosts over and everything, you know, and everything was supposed to be cool. We left. Well, then we get a call back, and um, I didn't go on the second call. Dusty went. Him and another guy went. But anyway, uh, then me and another guy went over there. Right. And uh, the stepmother's telling me, well, uh, the Native American spirits in my family didn't know that I knew I had the gift. Right. But now that they know I have the gift, they're going to give me more gift. Okay. <laughs> and, and I'm telling him, I'm like, you know, well, uh, we, we got to be at that at that house over there, you know, in about thirty minutes or so. We're gonna have to get out of here because I had to go for I busted out laughing. Right. And, and uh, the poor girl, I felt sorry for her because I'm I, like I said, she. I don't think, uh, and I'm not saying this in a bad way. Uh, I don't think elevator went all the way to the top. Okay? Right. Uh, for the best way I can say that. <laughs> so the stepmother and the dad, I'm sure, took advantage of the situation. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, and then I think uh, Dustin said he got called to come back over there again. And the girl's telling him that she's got seven portals. Or was it 11? I can't remember. There was a bunch of them. In her bedroom. Well, her bedroom was about the size of an average small bedroom. It was probably 10 by 12, maybe. Right. With a little closet in there. And she's telling yeah, there's portals all in this room, and there's one in the closet. And I kept hearing stuff scratching on the, you know, there's something in there scratching at the, at the wall. And he said, I opened the closet door up. The first thing I see is a mouse hole. <laughs> right. He said, I know what's scratching at the wall. So, so you <laughs> found the portal. <laughs> yeah, he said, I found the portal. He said it was about two inches around. <laughs> but anyway, that, and that just showed you what you run into. And, and you know as well as I do, you probably run into some of this stuff too. Right. And, well, that's like you mentioned, the one case with where, where there was the mobile home and directly next to it's the huge power transformer and they had the you know the high emf readings that i've seen that there was a case that we helped someone with not too long ago that um this this was a woman that was having hallucinations and she was or well she we later found out it was hallucinations now this was a call that we'd got from out of state was she claiming to be possessed or something? Or? Um, she she felt that something was trying to possess her and that she was coming under physical attack and she was seeing all kinds of things in her house and she could hear them running around and they were in the walls and everything else. So, and, um, you know, of course now she, she was quite a ways out of state. She was all the way in Michigan. So, and of course, me being here in Alabama, that's quite a ways to go for a case. So, so I got in touch with a friend of mine up there that handles cases, and he covered right. it for me. And they went in, found out that the the apartment she was in, the wiring was horrible. And sure, I think she needed a tinfoil hat. <laughs> right. It, it was. <laughs> It was about one step short of that, and, and said the that because of the wiring and electrical issues, the um, the um, EMS in the place were horrible. And you know, you know as well as I do that the high EMFs in themselves can cause hallucinations, exactly. can cause headaches, illnesses, all kinds of stuff. And you mix that one. Well, not only did they find the high EMFs, the apartment should have been condemned. Um, they found 
all kinds of black mold, you know, rat infestation, roach infestation. That said that it was one of the worst places they'd ever been in and couldn't believe that someone was actually living in there. And this woman was, you know, she she was an elderly woman that was half blind and, you know, she was in pretty bad shape physically anyway. And, uh, that automatically would make you feel bad for somebody, you know. Right, and so they, and, and um, he actually stepped in and, you know, basically made made the landlord you know he reported it so that the landlord had to correct the problems as soon as the landlord fixed the problems she quit experiencing paranormal activity right and it even helps her you know it's crazy what they can do oh yeah you you can have a ceiling fan running that's putting off emf you wouldn't know it mm-hmm. but if you're sleeping in there or you're sitting you know when you were close to there you're going to start getting the heebie-jeebies like, you know, something's watching me or, you know, I know something's in here. And, and you'll start thinking all kinds of stuff. The, the EMFs have been known to make people itch and scratch and everything else, you know, high or uh, whelps break out and stuff like that. So Right. Well, you know, one of the first questions when, when I'm talking to clients, when – if they tell me that they feel like something's watching them in their sleep or... Uh, no king, I haven't been to Lafayette Cemetery. I'd like to go. Yeah, what, Sorry about that. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's all right. Um, what, one of the first questions I normally ask them is if they plug their phone up on a charger on a right. stand next to their bed or if they have any electronics immediately next to their bed and yep. if there's a TV going close to it. You know what's in their room or, or what's in their bedroom within a few feet of the bed that you know I'll start asking those kind of questions and a lot of times I've, I've found that when they take the electronics out of the bedroom or even move them across the room that that can make a huge difference it will and uh, you know if you if you live in an older house especially um, where the the old wiring, it's not very well shielded, and you know, I mean, it's it's really easy to to develop a fear cage, mm-hmm. and you know, like in a basement or anything like that where they're exposed, you know, because you don't have a ceiling up there or any or anything insulation, nothing like that, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of times, you know, you'll have people. Um, saying, you know, they have something in their basement, there, there's something down there. Or every time they go down there, they, you know, they feel like they're being watched or, you know, they feel the hair stand up on their arm, stuff like that. Well, you've got a lot of bare wires down there, and if it's old wiring like that, it's not shielded anyway, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, it will develop or make you develop all kind of crazy ideas. Right. right. Well, if, well, if you look at the way that the moisture holds in any of the waves that are put off by it. Yeah. And, you know, the masonry is going to hold it. it th- those waves don't pass through it easily. A lot of them are reflected. So it, so it's bouncing off the walls and just kind of trapped in there. Right. And then the shielding on a lot of the old wiring is just cloth and paper. That's so, what I'm saying. It's, it's not, you know, uh, they're not shielded very well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, in a basement, especially like I said, where you have the open uh, floor joist above you and everything, and the wires are running up under there and they're out in the wide open. Right, and and then you know everybody's grown up seeing all the movies where you know everything bad that's going to happen typically is going to happen in the basement anyway. So that's right. there's already that ambiguity programmed in the back of your mind anyway. Like the people with the snake didn't have a basement. Right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't think uh, I don't think invisible snakes really like basements anyway. They like dry places. <laughs> well, um, well, so I have to ask, um, you know, talking about some of these cases, um, what would you say was the most active location that you've investigated? Uh, let me see. 
Well, actually, um, we did a little house in, in the next town over. We've done three over there, actually. The first one that we done, we did capture uh, a transparent entity on, on our DVR camera. Oh, wow. And uh, it, it's, like I said, it's pretty transparent, but if you if you pay close attention, you can tell it's a human form. You can see it actually turn like it's going to go out the door. And um, I got an EVP. Well, actually, I got about three. One of them I didn't understand why, but uh, I got one, and it was a kid. And the funny thing was there were no kids in the house. Um uh, they have a, a baby that sleeps in the room, and that's where we caught the entity on the, the camera. It was based on the crib where they said the baby would wake up like about 3 o'clock in the morning screaming. Uh, but anyway, I got it. I was coming through out of the living room because I just went and checked on one of our cameras that was set up in there, and I was coming into the uh, little hallway before you get into the dining room area there. And I said, okay, y'all need to talk to me. And I got a kid saying, no, just as plain as day. And uh, I got another one that sounded like two women talking. And they were saying, we got money. (laughs) And I don't know why, because nothing wasn't said about money. Hmm. And then I got one that said love. And it was like in a male raspy voice. So really, you know, there was there was a lot going on in there. It didn't really start happening until about, I'm going to say it was probably getting close to 2 o'clock maybe in the morning. And then there's a cemetery that's way out in the country. It's grown up. It has no name, but I got uh, the picture of the lady in red. That's where I got that at, or we got that one at. Right. I right. showed you that. Right. Okay, that's where we caught that at. And, of course, the dog-looking thing on the, on the tombstone slab that I couldn't figure out what the heck it was, really, but it looked kind of like a black-and-white dog. Right. It was, it was definitely strange-looking. I will say that. And, you know, you... The, When we take pictures, like I said, we always look first, and then we'll take a picture. Mm -hmm. Well, when we looked, in both of those cases where we got the the red, the lady in red and the dog-looking thing, when we looked, you didn't see anything. Mm -hmm. When we took the picture, they showed up. Right. So, I mean, that's really kind of strange, if you ask me. Mm I I agree. And, and, you know, that that brings me... that that brings another point to mind for me. Um, you know, the other day we were talking about the cameras, the digital cameras, and right. the some of the older cameras, the Polaroids, and you know when everyone was using the thirty-five millimeters and yeah, yeah, everything else. And I I was going to ask you your opinion on what your personal preference is for your investigations as far as still photography goes. I have a little Samsung digital that I use. And uh, people didn't used to think digital cameras was good for that, but I don't have any problems with mine. Um, The only problem that I have with mine is in the view window when you take the picture, you have the view screen on the back. And the picture will only stay there for a couple of seconds. And then if you want to look at it again, you've got to pull it up and the thing, you know. Well, if I'm taking pictures at the time, I'm not going to want to go into my library and look at, look at the pictures and everything. I'll wait till I get done, you know, when I get home, and then I'll look at my pictures. I'll usually pull them all up on the, on the computer and look at them, you know, where I can see them in bigger uh, size, but... That's what I use for my stills, and I have two uh, Sony Handycams. They're the little mini DVD Handycams that I use, uh, that I use besides the the DVR system. And I have a 
have booster lights that I run with them because, uh, as you know, Sony's night shot ain't what it used to be. Right. So you have to have a little extra, especially if you're in pitch dark, you ain't going to see a thing unless you've got a booster light. Right. And, and that was kind of interesting the other day when we were talking about the the way that Sony um, came about with their recall with the night shots. Right. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious, too. <laughs> for, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about there, when when the night shots first came out, they they were extremely powerful. And they they were so powerful, in fact, that if you were in well-lit conditions and turned on the night shot mode, given the right clothing, you could see through that clothing. And, you know, when people discovered this particular feature, um, needless to say, that camera became very popular. <laughs> uh, especially with guys that wanted to go to places like the beach or, <laughs> you know, just the mall, whatever. They, they, there were a lot of guys that bought handy cams with the night shot. And when Sony put out the recall, they I forgot how many million of them got sold. And during the recall, they only got a few thousand of them back. It, it's quite hilarious. Because the price of them actually went up. And if you look them up on eBay or anywhere, mm-hmm. um, you're going to see them running $500 or more. These are old cameras. Mm-hmm. Right. They they went up where now the night shot cost just as much, if not more, used as it did when it was new. That's what I'm that. saying. Yeah, yeah. Because the paranormal investigators all want them because the... You know, the night shot is such a powerful night vision. And, you know, you still have people that <laughs> want them for the other little side effect of that feature. Right. But, 30 old men. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I'll throw this out there, too. Um, you know, a lot of paranormal investigators like to wear the all-black T-shirts. and right. And, and all the dark clothing and stuff like that on investigations. Make them look cool. Mm-hmm. Right. It, if you're wearing that and you're using a decently powerful infrared camera, um, you should be mindful what undergarments you choose to wear. Exactly. You better wear some black ones. Right, because certain ones will show straight through on the on the camera. <laughs> so just a little heads up on that. Um, and, and like I said, I, I I wear usually I wear like white t-shirts and stuff. I, I don't go for all this dressed in black and look like um, you're straight out of taps on on a uh, sci-fi or something, you know. Uh. <laughs> right, right. I, I seen a picture the other day that it it showed a picture of. Um, Oh, I think I had the guys from Ghost Adventures on there, and um, we can get into a whole other topic on that one, right? And, and I, I think it, I think I had them on there, and then it had um, like a rock band on there, and it said, "Which one is the rock band, and which one is the <laughs> are the paranormal investigators?" You know, and and the way it looked, the way they were all lined up and standing, you couldn't really tell the difference. They were dressed and posed about the same in the pictures. Hey, we're being warned here. <laughs> Donald said this is a family show, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, well, you know, all we can say is, you know, we're putting information out there for, you know, preventative use. You know, if anyone right. misuses we're, we're that, we, we people, can't be you know, responsible. Uh, so they don't get their unmentionables put on the camera, you know. Right, <laughs> right, right. And um, we'll have to put a disclaimer out there. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> don't do this at home, folks. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um. So I um. So covering covering the cameras and stuff that. Uh, I'm sure you can recall the days when everybody was saying that digital photography would never be accepted as... Right, that's what I was saying earlier. 
right as the paranormal as useful and paranormal and now it's changed so much and you know we also talked about thanks Donald <laughs> yep and um we also talked about the audio you know how everything's going to the digital audio now but right and, and when we're talking about that you brought up a very good point about the mechanical cassette recorders and and if you could the little analogs I love mine like I said, it, I get more EVPs on my little analog recorder than I do my digital, hands down. Right, and and, and the point that, that you had made talking about, you know, a lot of people have steered away from them because you get the the tape hiss and the background and everything. Exactly. And what people don't realize, though, is that motor running in the background when you're recording creates a white noise effect mm -hmm. that gives spirits more to connect with than a digital. Digital don't put that out. So, you know, you, you're running your digital recorder and your uh, white noise, uh, uh, whatever you got it on, if you're using white noise, you're going to have it playing on something. Uh, with a digital recorder, you don't have to do that. Right. We, you know, we were talking about that because, you know, like I'd mentioned to you, the very first recorder I used was a twenty dollar Radio Shack micro cassette, and you know, I, I jokingly said how happy I was when I upgraded from my Radio Shack brand to the right. Olympus Radio Shack brand. <laughs> I think mine's a Sony. I'm not sure. Right, and. You know, it's kind of funny. Everybody now will go out and spend a hundred dollars on a digital, exactly, and then spend fifty dollars yeah. on a noise generator and it, everything that's else. That's what I was saying. Yeah. So, so that that was a that that was an excellent point that you brought up. And I also uh, I build my own uh, EM pumps, and uh, you know it, it is a. a I won't say it's a fact, but it's it's a uh, well-known thing in the paranormal field that they will use EMF to you know to communicate through to uh, mm -hmm. manifest whatever. And uh, I got the schematics off of YouTube. It's just a little bitty thing, but it does put off enough EMF to max out a K2 meter. Right. And, um, and and that's that's something that I try to encourage people to do as well as to when they can build their own equipment because the schematics are there and a lot of times it it's broken down to be so simple that even if you don't have a lot of background, hey, baby, you can still do it. Right, right. I built two of them in the first one. It worked, but it needed a little work. And the second one I did was 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 really good. It worked great. Uh, and it's basically just a little motor with a with a rare earth magnet on it and uh, an on off switch and a little light that tells you it's running. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and the whole box is about maybe two inches long by inch and a half wide by and about an inch tall. But it does work. I mean, you know, I, I put the K meter up to it; it'll max it out. Absolutely, and and just for reference, if you if you had to guess, for anyone who's thinking about doing this themselves, just off the top of your head, ballpark figure, how much would you would you guesstimate that it probably cost you to build one? I spent. Uh, I bought four of the rare earth magnets on eBay, and I spent like uh, six dollars. Wow! And then I, the little case cost a couple of dollars, so that's eight. And I took the motor out of a uh, old hard drive, mm -hmm. or not a hard drive, but a, a an old CD player out of a computer. The you know the, the disc. A little servo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I'm going to say roughly about 10 bucks tops that I spent actually on 
parts that I had to buy. Uh, it's always good to run a resistor between your, your switch and your, your main wire. So, you know, I bought the resistors and the magnets and the little LED lights in the box. I probably spent a total of maybe 10 bucks, and they do work, so. Right, so so there you go for anyone listening. Instead of going to, you know, going to these websites, spending fifty, sixty, hundred dollars, and, and you can get bigger and better, of course. But you know, uh, my next project is uh, I was going to do one of the the little uh, sensory devices, mm-hmm. and uh, I found a schematic on there, and what they used was the bottom of a. Uh, CD disc full, and they mounted you know the parts on the, the little stem that comes up and then you know some of them on the base there and it actually it will work if you as much as you can set it on a table and if you if you barely tap on that table it'll light that thing up right so, I mean they do work uh, that was going to be one of my next projects but I ain't got around to doing that yet Right, and um, and that's definitely definitely something that comes in handy, and you can get you can make so much cheaper because everybody knows that all of us paranormal investigators are loaded with money and don't have full time right. jobs, and you know we you know we have money to blow, so I got so much money I throw it away at the time, you know. Right. Right, I, I use it to light the barbecue grill and <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> start the fireplace up and all that good stuff. No, actually, uh, for everybody out there, uh, I, I'm I'm a disabled person. I have a fixed income, so I don't have a lot of money to spend. But you don't need a lot of money. You can do it yourself a whole lot cheaper than what you can go out and buy it for. Um, and just I'm going to throw this out there because a lot of people don't think and do this anymore because all this fancy tech equipment Mm -hmm. but you know if you have a claim of footsteps going down a hallway everybody wants to run out and buy those sensors that you put on both sides of the hall well if it goes through there to set this off how much did you spend for that right you can throw some talcum powder on the daggum floor if something walks through there you're going to see the footprint Uh, and and that is something that was used old school, right? You know, <laughs> right. That that's when you're getting back to the basics. Exactly, but you can. That's what I'm saying. You right. don't need to spend a fortune, and you don't have to have all the high dollar equipment to get good evidence. You really don't. Right, and, and think about it. What you know? What is you know? You can go to a dollar store or something and pick up some of the powder for like a dollar or two versus. Tied up nearly a hundred bucks in a geophone. Exactly. That was the name of what I was trying to think of. Geophone. That's what I was going to build. But <laughs> and I'll get around to it one of these days. Uh, King says, "Does the infrared camera the best equipment in ghost hunting?" E one of the best things you can have, and that's one thing I will spend a little bit of money on is is an infrared camera because you can't see in the dark without it. You know, I mean, and you don't want to use flashlights because that defeats the whole purpose. Why Why are you going to go investigate in a dark place if you're going to have flashlights on? I, I definitely agree with that. Cheryl says she has a thermal. Well, good for you. I want one. <laughs> Send that booger right on over to my house. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, you know, the... The thermal is it. It comes in handy. Um, I just saw your comment there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. For it, for anyone listening that's not in the chat, we're talking about money, and I, I just posted a comment in the chat. I, I said my ship finally came in, but I was stuck at the airport. I always <laughs> said when my ship came in, it'd be a little rowboat with a hole in it. <laughs> right, it'd be the dinghy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Be like the one on the Andy Griffith show where they captured a criminal because he went out in the boat with a hole in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It, 
and, and that's that's why I love putting out this kind of information about how to save money and you know do your own equipment and not tie up everything, not fall for every gimmick that you see out there because there are plenty. There's so and, many. And the the uh, ghost hunter stores out there, they're in it to make money, people. I don't care what they say. Right. It, there's so many things. That it, it's the same thing that they sell at Walmart, you know, the hardware stores, whatever. They'll slap ghost hunting on the label, jack up the price. and I'll tell you a little secret. You can go to Walmart and buy a infrared uh, battery operated field camera that you strap to a tree. Infrared. Yes. And you can mount that sucker anywhere you want it and it will take pictures of anything that passes by. Yes. We, we and actually it runs you service. about a hundred bucks, which is not bad for a good, you know, battery powered camera that you ain't gotta run cables to or charge all the time. Well you just change the batteries in them. Yep. We we actually use those. I had to give props to Donald. He he came up with that idea. And And it's a good idea. Yes. He he came up with that idea uh, about a year ago, and we have had some fantastic results with those. And it, um, you know, it it really it, it really does a wonderful job. And a lot of people don't know, but you can take video or still images with them, either one. Uh, right, exactly. So, but yeah, it. I love putting out these money-saving ideas because, you know, like, like we were joking about before, you know, there there are very few people that do paranormal investigation full-time. Most of us work full-time jobs. Most of us are on tight budgets. We, you know, we're having to struggle to buy that equipment. And, you know, so why struggle so much if you don't have to? Well, the thing about it is, is the money that you spend on that all that real fancy, expensive equipment could be spent for fuel to go to, you know, the next place you're going. Exactly. You know, if you if you were going like when we went to Fayetteville, you know, it was a three and a half hour trip up there and three and a half hour back. We spent probably about one hundred twenty forty bucks in gas. Right. Right, and, and especially because I know that you don't just investigate locally. You do some fairly extensive traveling, and that can add up fairly quick because just your fuel costs, then, you know, you've got your lodging. And well, you got that. You got your food. You got your lodging. You got, you know, uh, and you, you don't know what other little surprises are going to lay in wait, like you might have a blowout or, you know, or... But, you know, there's always something. Exactly. And, um, you know, for something about the area you're in, there's a ton of history there. You've got your Civil War history, your Native American history. There are so many, um, you know, there's a lot of sightings of your um, cryptozoological creatures in there, in that area. And right. My daughter lives right across from a Civil War cemetery. Oh, wow. And I mean, it, it's not just Civil War. There's, you know, other people's buried there, but it, 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 it has a part that is just a Civil War cemetery from back, you know, during that time. Right. So so I imagine that with, with your group focusing on such a broad spectrum of the paranormal, I, I can imagine with your location it does kind of keep you busy in that aspect of it because well, I, I mean we're I always looking for new places to go you know and uh it, you know if we don't have calls coming in you know for personal cases mm. you know that's like the hospital up there we got an email you know hey y'all come up and check out my hospital okay <laughs> so we did right. and uh i want to go to the bell witch cage that's, well, but they will let you take cameras in there Oh, really? I did not know that. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, that kind of blew that one up. I'm like, well, I don't know so much if I want to go up there now or not. <laughs> you know, what good would it do if you see something you can't take a picture? Right, that's that, that's strange. I, I, I did not know that because that's always been one of the places that I've wanted to check out. 
Exactly. And there's a mansion in Dover that I want to check out, too. Uh, it's going to be a little difficult because the lady that owns it, she's an elderly lady, she doesn't live there. But she won't let nobody, they got a piss around that thing, she won't let nobody in there. I don't know why. Well, yeah, dude, because people going in there and trashing the place, probably. But And see, that's another thing is... is other people can mess things up for, you know, decent teams to be able to get into places. Yes. Dover also has the Civil War battleground up there where they had the cannons on the river. And uh, I've been there with my family, you know, just to because I, I was I'm into the Civil War stuff anyway. And actually, we've been up there a couple of times. I never even actually thought about going up there, and I don't know if they'll even let you go up there at night time anyway, but I would love to go in there with, you know, some equipment and everything and, and just see if I could capture anything going on in there. I'm sure there's there's got to be uh, some kind of residue left over from that. Right. Right, I, I would agree. Um, now, now, something I'm curious about, I know there's quite a few Civil War reenactments in the area. They have one about, uh, it's probably about 12, 14 miles from me. Have you ever got to go in behind one of those reenactments or during one? We were there, actually, when they did one, and they had the tent set up and everything, you know, and the old foot lockers they used back then, the, you know, it was pretty neat how it all works. But we were there, uh, I'm going to say we probably got there toward the end of it, and, uh, of course, I'm looking to see if there's any any real stuff following along behind me, you know. Right. And I had my digital with me, but and I did take some pictures, but I didn't get anything, unfortunately. Oh. Now, if I ever make it, uh, I want to go to Chickamauga, and I want to go to uh, the big one, of course. Right. Now, I have been to Chickamauga, and. That one, I, we didn't get a lot of results as far as on film, but you can just, there's a lot of energy there, I guess you'd say. You, right, and, and you know, you may not get anything on your recorders, and you may not get anything on your cameras, but I guarantee you, you're going to have some personal experiences in places like that. Right. It it was one of those places where you just walk up and you can kind of feel it in the air, so to speak. And um, Tunnel Hill is an interesting, interesting place. Um, so um, so is Murfreesboro. Oh. Yeah, I've been up through there, and uh, I didn't get to go to. And <laughs> I went to Waverly Hills, and for any of you that don't know, Waverly Hills Sanatorium is over in Louisville, Kentucky. That is an awesome place, and it's huge. And <laughs> I've got to ask your opinion on what do you think about the uh, the current plan with it, where it's recently been sold, and the plans are to renovate it and make it into a hotel. I think they're idiots. <laughs> That's about what I think. <laughs> I mean, you know... Uh, I was in the morgue, and it was me and another guy went up there, and uh, I got on that little thing and had him slide me up in the the body freezer. They had a couple of the freezers and little freezers in there. They kept bodies in, you know, until they stored them, I guess, forever. But uh, <laughs> he shoved me up in there, and I'm laying in there, and I had my digital recorder. I wish I'd have had my other one. But I had my digital recorder, and I'm laying in there, and I said, is there anybody here with me? And I got just as plain as the nose on your face. I'm with you. Oh, wow. And then we were in the death tunnel. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a bum leg. A lot of people that, that know me on here, you know, heard me talk about it. I have a, a, a 
clotted artery in my leg, so it makes it hard on me walking. And uh, so we only went about halfway down in the death tunnel, and you know, we sit down there, and we were just sitting there doing EVP and, you know, snapping some pictures and stuff like that, which we didn't see anything in the pictures, but... And I had my recorder running, and it did not pick it up, and I was so mad. Oh, I can imagine. But I'm sitting there, and you hear coming from the bottom up, heel to toe, boot steps. Oh, wow. And this guy that's with me, he says, I've been in concrete work a long time. That's the concrete settling. Concrete don't settle heel to toe. (laughs) It just don't, you know I mean? And I played that recorder back, and it wasn't on there, and I was so mad. I'm like, dang, you know, that would have been like, you know, the uh, holy grail of uh, footsteps right there, you know. Mm -hmm. And it didn't pick it up. And I was so upset. (laughs) Right. That's always the worst when when you have something so loud. We we did a case last year that, that was like that. We... All of us were outside this house, and it, it wasn't a very big place, but everyone was outside, and we hear these footsteps so loudly that we, you know, we're all outside, and we hear the footsteps plainly inside the house. And nobody's in there. And nobody's in there at all. And, you know, so I was around at the side of the house there at, there was a couple of investigators on the front porch and I was looking at the basement and or not the basement but the little cellar up underneath the house and I heard it and it sounded like someone running across the house and when that happened I went around to see who was running across there and there was no one in there It that loud it you could feel the floor vibrating and of course you know I thought when we were played it back it would be just this huge thunderous footsteps and of course it picked it up but it was you know just barely heard it when we recorded it was strange and then that's always frustrating okay people I can't spell but I'm trying to spell Missouri here <laughs> <laughs> But uh, M I crooked letter crooked letter. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm not even gonna finish typing that since I can't spell. But uh, there's a Fort Wayne, Missouri too. They're saying Fort Wayne, Indiana, Fort Wayne, Detroit. There's a Fort Wayne, Missouri. I've been there. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying. It's just so aggravating when you you hear this stuff. You know. It's kind of like when you, if you're in a location and something touches you, but you don't have it on a camera and you don't have it on a recorder saying, I'm touching you, you know, it makes you angry because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited because something touched me, but I'm mad because I can't prove it. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and, and Kat has the proper spelling of Missouri there for us, M-O. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, I like them abbreviated versions anyway. <laughs> But, yeah, you know, something touches you or something, and you're like, crap, how am I going to tell people? And they're they're going to say, it's kind of like the big one that got away. Exactly. Exactly. Misery. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's stuff like that is, is just, uh, and we were on the fifth floor, and the story is that a nurse hung herself right outside of room 205. Five, I want to say, two, five, two, six, something like that. Okay, uh, the story is that she hung herself from the pipes outside of the room because she had gotten pregnant out of wedlock by one of the doctors or so, and he refused to acknowledge his part in this. And back in them days, you know, that was a no-no. Right. So she supposedly hung herself on these pipes, and there was a story about another woman being pushed out of the window in that same room there next to where she hung herself. Now, also, I heard that that they took her in there and they aborted her baby. Anyways, all the stories. But uh, I got an EVP right there where she supposedly hung herself and right outside of that room that said, Help me walk. Oh, wow. Now... 
to enlighten people on the what they did there, if you, some of you may not know. Trying to cure the tuberculosis, tuberculosis patients, they used all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, they would sit them outside. They had like these balconies that went around this building that were like these big balconies, and they would sit them out there because the fresh air would help them. And I have pictures of them sitting out there with snow blowing in on them and snow on their blankets and everything, and they were outside in this. Uh, also, they would do things like stack sa uh, sandbags on their chest trying to compress their lungs. And they would remove some of their ribs to give the lungs room to expand. Okay, now, if you remove your ribs, you can't stand straight and you ain't going to walk worth crap. Right. So, I could understand the lady saying, help me walk. Exactly. It made sense, you know, and I'm like, at first I'm like, help me walk, you know, and then it dawned on me, you know, this was probably one of the patients who had the surgery where they removed some of her ribs or something and she couldn't walk, you know, like she wanted to. So, I mean, that was good. I love that. Yes, Waverly Hills, Brian. And that was basically the height of what we got. Well, no, I take that back. I got an EVP of a moan, and it sounded just like something right out of a cartoon. You know, in the cartoons where they do the, the ghost ghost cartoons, and you hear them go, ooh. It sounded exactly like that. And it was kind of low, and I enhanced it a little bit where I could hear it better, and it sounded just like something out of a cartoon. <laughs> I ought to send you that EVP sometime if you hear it. Right, I mean, it, it was creepy. It really was. It was. Ooh, like somebody in pain or something. Right. That that reminds me of one that I got a couple of years ago. That you you hear a moan like that and then a door slam. Right. Right. And but but it's not like a normal moan. It's have you ever been around someone when they died? When they when they drew that last breath and you hear that death moan. I was in the room with my mother and watched her take her last breath. You, you know, it's got that very distinct sound to it. Yeah. I picked up a EVP at a place that was a rehab center and an asylum. And I um, caught that. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like a man, and you hear what sounds like a death moan. And then right. immediately afterward, you hear a door slam. Well, now that one sounded like a man, like a, you know, like I said, it was like ooh, you know. But my mother and and it's hard to talk about it because you know I was I watched her do it, and uh, right. when when she took that last breath, and it's like you know, and kind of and that's a sound you just don't want to hear, right? You know, right? It very unnerving. To say the least. Um, you you know that's I, I'll ask this. What um, what would you say is the most comical EVP you've ever got? Comical. Okay, <laughs> I'll give you one. This creeped my daughter out, but I thought it was funny. Of course, I, I've got that kind of sense of humor. Right. But uh, her and my son-in-law, who was her fiance at the time, lived in an apartment up here in town. And it was an old house that had been converted. It had like a one upstairs apartment, two downstairs. Well, they come over to my house one night, and they're like, you know, we've got this shadow figure. We've seen it, you know, here, there, and yonder in the house. You know, will you come over here to investigate? Of course, my son-in-law, he was kind of into it, too, so he wanted to do it with me. <laughs> and... and I almost feel bad saying this now but because I don't provoke as a rule but I did that night because I knew something was there and it just wasn't wasn't I could feel it it just wasn't cooperating but anyway make a long story short I got two good EVPs in there one was in the living room they got a fireplace just before you go into the hallway that goes you know where the, the two bedrooms are the kitchen and all that 
And uh, I'm standing there in the living room. I'm using my analog recorder because I love this thing. <laughs> but uh, I said, can you make a sound? And I knocked on the fireplace, you know, like that. Right. I said, can you knock on something like this? And I knocked on the fireplace. When I played the recording back, I had two voices on there. One was male and one was female. And the female said, get him. And the male said, we've got him between us. Oh, wow. And then later, uh, we were, and this was a different night because I actually investigated it twice, but we had one of my daughter's friends over there that let us borrow her at the time I didn't even have a camera mm-hmm. and uh, she let she borrowed one from her grandparents and brought it over and let us use it <laughs> and we got two good EVPs th- this time and one of them was is definitely a class A but uh, we had left the recorder in the, in the little bedroom in the, the back there and we shut the door and we were sitting in the kitchen smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and talking and carrying on laughing, cutting up. My son-in-law went back in there to get the recorder, and you'll hear him when we play it back. You'll hear the door open because it had the old knobs. You know, they made no, a lot of noise when you open them. You hear the door, the knob turn, the door open. He goes in there, and he'll, he, you'll hear him say, I'm back. <laughs> Where's the recorder at? And right before he said, where's the recorder at? You hear, go away. Wow. It was plain. I mean, very plain. <laughs> okay, but that's not the creme de la creme. The best one was, when he was telling me about them, like, them leaving a candle on the kitchen table. Mm-hmm. And they, it was burning, but they had to go somewhere, so they blew the candle out. It's sitting on the kitchen table. Mm-hmm. He said when they got back, it was in the bathroom, and it was lit. Oh, wow. Okay, well, the bathroom's right around the corner from the kitchen there. There's a little big bathroom in there. So we went in there, and he was telling me about the candle sitting on the bathtub being lit and blah, blah, blah. We turn around, and I come back out into the hallway. And he's right behind me. And I said, where the hell are you hiding at? <laughs> and when I played that thing back, it said, right behind you, and had that evil little laugh at the end of it. <laughs> oh, wow, that's awesome. And what really ticks me off is that tape went missing. Oh, no. I cannot find it. I, and I kept, keep all the tapes, and I could not find that tape. It's gone. That, that I had sounds it like my luck. Where it was, you know, where we were at, I had it labeled where we were at and everything, and it's just gone. Oh, no. But that that was the best one, though. We get right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was laughing at my daughter. I was like, oh, my God. She's about to have it back on fit. And I'm laughing. I'm like, that's so cool. <laughs> right, right. That's that's a typical reaction. Uh, that... You know, because that's what you're doing it for. That's what you want, you know. Right. And she said, oh, my God, oh, my God. I said, calm down. I thought it was cool. (laughs) And then she wouldn't let us come back and investigate no more. Because you're going to tick it off, and it's going to be all after me. (laughs) I said, you're the one that asked me to come do this, you know. And it was funny. It it was. I was like, that's so cool. Right, that's... (laughs) I, I can imagine from the sound of it the look on her face when she heard that. <laughs> oh man, she was like, "Oh my!" And her eyes were about as big as half a dollar. You know, and she's like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> so, so now, well, now that brings me to another question, and, and this is one that is always I always enjoy this myself. Um, you know, you you go in. Some people are going to call you, and they're going to want you to come out and check their home out or check out their business because they're getting these reports or whatever. Even though they call you out to investigate, they're still very skeptical, but they're still not quite sure that it's not real, you know. they Right. So e- even though they're very skeptical, they're going to call you out to investigate anyway. And you do find activity. So you're you know, you're doing your follow-up with them and, you know, you're showing them what you found during the investigation and everything. 
What would you say is the funniest reaction you've got from a client when you've showed them some compelling evidence that you found? Well, <laughs> I would have to say my daughter when I played that EVP. <laughs> <laughs> that was classic. And I wish somebody would have took a picture of that because it, it, the, the expression on her face was just priceless. <laughs> right. I'm not kidding. And uh, Brian said, Bruce Brothers done one on Waverly Hills. Yes, they did. And I did an interview with Christopher St. Booth on my show, and he's a really cool guy. But yeah, we uh, that face I'm telling you, and then she said, and I said, well, we have to come back tomorrow and finish this up. No, you're not. <laughs> you're gonna make it mad. It's gonna come after me. <laughs> right, and, and there's nothing better than the look of seeing someone at that very moment that they go from being a skeptic to being a believer. <laughs> Well, see, that's the thing, though. She right. wasn't a skeptic, necessarily, mm -hmm. but she really hadn't heard nothing like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so she's like, oh, my God. <laughs> it, it, it's just so priceless, though. I, I, I'll give anything to have a picture of her, the expression on her face so I can show it to her every time she comes over. <laughs> you remember this? <laughs> right. right. That... Um... Well, and some, something I was wanting to ask you about on, while we were talking about EVPs and things like that is how, how do you feel about things like the, you know, like the SB7, Spirit Box? Oh, and the Echo PSB7? Box. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Never used one. Never used one. Uh, now, I do have Echo Box on my phone. Really? Oh. And I think what I did, I tried an experiment. Mm -hmm. Me and my son in law over at his house. I downloaded a white noise app and I played it along with the Echo Box and we had the Echo Box run through a sound system. Mm -hmm. And yes, we were picking up responses. Uh, one of them was talking about a grave in the yard hmm. and uh, we got two or three names on, on demand. So, you know, I mean really that's how you know when something's working is if you can get uh, we asked how many spirits were in the room and it sent three and then we asked uh, you know what are your names and we got three names right so you can't it's hard to deny that you know when you get it so but it was an experiment like I said with a white noise app and, and we had it run through a sound system where because you can't turn Echo Box up all the way without running it through external speakers or it'll squelch real bad. Right. Right. Now, so I, will say, I, will, I will say this about Echo Vox. Um, we've been testing it for the past several months. And Donald there in the chat room, he, he can vouch for this. Um, Donald's our operations manager. He, you know, he's, he's one of them that, you know, I can't brag on him enough. He's... You know, he <laughs> he does wonders for the team. He he helps us out in a lot of ways, and he's been helping us with the testing on it. And we've tried it on several investigations, and he can vouch for this, that some of the results we've got from it have been just fascinating. And one, you, one you will because it's different from, you know, like the PSB-7. It don't play radio stations. You know, it don't skip through radio stations. Right, right. And instead of the possibility of picking up a, you know, a DJ making an announcement or something exactly. like that, it, it's a live microphone with just some white noise. And, and normally I'm the most skeptical person you will ever meet when it comes to phone apps. because. And I was too. Right. But that one is is one that uh, we've been given a serious look to. Uh, and I, I, you, uh, I, I sit there and run in here in my bedroom one night and I unhook my, my computer speakers and plug them in there so I can turn it up. Because like I said, it'll squelch real bad if you don't. But I sit here and let that thing run and I'm sitting here, you know, and I'm just casually talking now. I haven't mentioned this yet, so everybody, I have a uh, friendly spirit that lives here in the house, but it stays in this bedroom most of the time. 
Uh, my wife actually saw the shadow figure of it. I haven't seen it, but I I know when it's here, my dog goes nuts and gets under my desk and won't come out. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I sit there and run this thing one night, and I'm you know, talking to myself, well, are you in here right now? And I knew it was because, you know, my dog was doing its funny little thing. And uh, I said, you know, uh, do you hang out in here a lot? And I got yes pretty, very, very plainly. And uh, I don't remember I asked a few more things, but I got a couple of hits on there. I got yes, and I got, uh, I asked, uh, I think it was, I asked the age, and it was like 65. Right. And I, I've been told by someone who who uh, claims to be a medium that said that uh, he was the elderly gentleman that was here like, uh, he didn't live here. He was here before the house was built. That's what he was saying. But now I got 65, and that would put it, this house is probably, I'm going to say this house is probably pushing over 100, so I don't see that. But <laughs> Right. I, you, you know, and I will say this, as far as the, the Echo Vox goes, one one particular case that we we got some extremely good validation for it was an investigation we did back in August or September. Uh, we were it, it was a place that Donald had investigated before and knew quite a bit of history on, but I it, it was my first time investigating there. And I set up the Echo Vox, and we, we were doing an, EV, an EVP session with it. And as we're asking questions and answers, uh, Donald had told me a little bit of the history, and he asked a particular question about one of the people who died there. He asked for a name, and the exact correct name comes through then he asked for a cause of death the correct cause of death comes through he asked for who's in the basement and that comes through correctly and how did they die and that cause of death comes through correctly I mean it it was mind blowingly accurate so that, that was when I started to really start using it as a tool and I won't say that I'm a hundred percent sold on it, but I'm about ninety eight percent there. Well, what I like about it is, like I said, it's not. And and you know, Donald's mentioned in the PSB seven is good too. I've never tried one. I'd like to, but you know how us poor folks are. We can't afford that stuff. <laughs> anyway, uh, the Echo Box uses snippets of voice that are all run into like a, a uh, continuous uh, file. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to get full words unless something is saying a full word. So it almost makes it a, a, a guaranteed thing. If you get a full word out of it, you can pretty much count on it being you know, an EVP because you just don't get full words. It's just all it is is just little snippets. Right. Right. And and I don't know how much you've used it, but or how much you've used the Echo Vox, but I've even had different languages come through. And I've picked up different accents coming through it. Now that, that would be cool. I'd love, I'd like to do that. That um would we were using Echo Vox on one particular investigation, and it, on the same investigation, actually, we had a a lady come through with a British accent, and then we had a male come through that was speaking Spanish. Wow! And I asked the homeowner about if she knew anything about any history of a woman that had a British accent that might have lived in that area. And she confirmed that two houses down, 
there was a woman that used to live there that had a British accent that had died several years earlier. And wow. there, cool. there were several Mexican immigrants that lived on the block as well that had lived and died in that area. And it, it was quite fascinating. And now, well, uh, I've got to ask you, mm -hmm. what is your thoughts on the obelisk? Because I don't put much faith in it. I, um, with, with the obelisk, I, I, I don't have much faith in those either. It, I think it's just, it, it, it spits out random words, and you might be lucky enough to just have something come out of it that sounds close to what you were asking, you know. I don't, I don't, I just don't believe too much in in those things that spit out words on a random basis like that. Right, I, I I'm not exactly sold on those. Um, it just, it, it's too. That that's one that it, it would take something very very compelling to really truly sell me on it. I'm I'm not going to say that it couldn't work but I'm I, I'm skeptical <laughs> I'll just say that <laughs> but. Uh, King the echo box and the spirit box are pretty much just like using a recorder the only difference is, is, is you get the stuff in real time At least that's the way I see it. I don't see it as being like a Ouija board or anything like that. Right, so, um, well, what would you say your thoughts on the Ouija board are? I don't have one. I don't want one. And I don't use one. <laughs> right, right. I mean, pretty simple, you know. I, I, I would agree. And... And, and when people ask me about it, you know, there's there's always the argument about, oh, well, it's harmless, or no, it's dangerous, or, you know, there's both sides of that argument, but... Right, and uh, yeah, people saying, well, if you know how to use one and how to close it, it, when you use it, it's not a problem or anything, you know. I don't buy that, that whole closing thing. Right, and, and aside from that... Uh, I mean, at, at the same time, someone could, you know, it it could be said that using a, um, you know, something like a echo box or a spirit box or even an EVP session may be similar as far as you're attempting to make that connection. Right. But, you know, even despite any any other reservations that you might have about the Ouija board, um there's really no scientific or no solid evidence that you can get from an Ouija board whereas from EVP or something you have a solid record. Right. That's always been my personal opinion. Somebody was making an argument with me about something the other day and I used EVPs as, as an example. You know, they were saying something, you know, and I said, well, you can't prove that. But when you get an EVP to a direct question on a recorder, that's proof that you actually talked to something that wasn't there. Right. Or it was there, but you couldn't see it. Right, a absolutely. Um, you know, polyester clothing doesn't rustle around and make intelligent responses, or, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, wind yeah. doesn't. <laughs> wind ain't going to say, my name's Andy. Right. <laughs> Which was an EVP we got. I asked, uh, you know, for a name, and it said Andy. Right. Oh. Now, uh, this was uh, at my daughter's house where they live now. They live out in the country, uh, next town down from me to the south there. And uh, we were out there just goofing around one night, me and him, and I had my recorder out there, and uh, I had my uh little Sony night shop with me, mm -hmm. which, uh, and I feel ignorant as hell because I've got to turn the night shot on. <laughs> and I'm like, man, it's not showing up, you know, and everything. And I, couldn't, 
it, it, I knew I turned it on. Well, what it was is I always leave it on night shot. So somehow it got turned off and I didn't know it. I'm like, my night shot's not working. I can't see anything. And, uh, but anyway, we had been out and there's a field out behind his house. And, you know, it's fenced off and there's a gate there and there's a little shed back there where he keeps his lawnmower and stuff like that. Well, we, he said that he was out there and putting the lawnmower up one day and he got a weird feeling like something was out there. So we go out there with the camera and the recorder, and we're standing out there, you know, talking to apparently nothing because nothing was answering. But when we were coming back, as we were coming through the gate, I made the comment, uh, you can follow us up here, but you can't stay. you got to go back. Right. Well, right there when we came through that gate is where I said that, so I know where the EVP was. And the EVP said, I belong here. Wow. Okay, then we go up further, and there's a tree out there in his yard, which is up, you know, not far from the front porch there, or side porch or whatever. Right about when we got there, a voice came right out of the air and said, I ain't staying. Huh. It, and it's hard to... To say that those aren't intelligent responses. Well, the, the thing about that one was it was a disembodied voice come right out of the air, right in our ear. And the recorder also picked it up. So I had it on my recorder and I had the EVP saved. Wow. And that tripped us out. He's like, did you say that? I said, no, I didn't say that. Why would I say that? <laughs> Wow. That, yeah, it was, that was a trip. That was the first uh, disembodied voice I ever got, <laughs> and it, it it was just wild, you know. It's those unexpected things that make it all worthwhile. Right, I I would definitely agree. Um, so what what would you say was your most interesting experience while you were on an investigation? I'll say most intense experience while on an investigation. Well, I've never had anything to push me or or do any of this kind of stuff, so I've really never had nothing that that just scared the bejesus out of me. Mm -hmm. I would have to say when we caught the transparent figure on the IR camera, that was probably the most intense because I was sitting there watching a monitor. I saw it when it happened. You know, I'm like, wow. You know, and, and it was me and one of our other teammates and, and the girl that lived in the house were in there watching the monitor. And and uh, Dusty was in the actual room where we caught it at, laying in the corner over on the floor doing EVP stuff. And he didn't know it was happening. And uh, we saw it go by the monitor. And I'm like, did you see that? They jump up, running there, explaining to him what they saw. And... Uh, you see this thing moving, it actually moves while there's, when they first come in there, you see it turning like it's going out the door. They come in and it's leaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, it was just wild catching it, you know, on that monitor, seeing it happen live. Right, I, I can imagine. Well, um, and, and something that, I've, that I meant to ask you at the beginning of the show, and I did it, was what really... Um, what really sparked your interest in the paranormal? How, how did all of this kind of come to be? Uh, well, when I was nine years old, I saw my first spirit. Uh, a a full-blown apparition, live looking as you and me walking down the sidewalk. Oh, wow. Uh, my brother and I was coming home from playing down the, down the road there. We were coming up the sidewalk and right in front of my neighbor's house, uh, his mother walked past us calling for him. Mm -hmm. And how I knew it couldn't be his mother calling for him is she had died two weeks earlier. Oh, wow. But it was her, and she was wearing the same dress that I seen her in the last time I seen her alive. Huh. And uh, I turned into the yard there and turned around and looked. Of course, wasn't nothing there. I go in the house and I'm all excited. I'm telling my grandmother now, you know, I'm like, I just saw a ghost. 
I just saw I saw uh, Bud's mother walk past us on the sidewalk, and she's like, "You didn't see that? There ain't no such thing, you know." Well, after you hear enough of that, you don't see stuff anymore. Right. Or at least I didn't. I, I quit experience, but I had like two or three experiences before that happened. But finally, it got to the point where I just didn't see stuff anymore. But I knew this wasn't a figment of my imagination. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, all the time I was growing up, I was, you know, I would think about that every now and then. I'm like, you know, I can't believe they didn't believe me. Of course, when you're a kid, you think they're supposed to believe you. You know, why would I lie about that, you know? <clears throat> anyway, uh, I got into watching Taps. And this is the way a lot of people, I guess, you know, they really start getting involved and watch shows like that. The only difference is that I don't do things the way they do. That's a TV show where I, I'm smart enough to know better. Right. But, uh, and of course, back when Taps first came out back in 2004, around right there somewhere, uh, they were more real. They debunked stuff. They did, you know, what they claimed to do. Right. So I'm sitting there watching this show and I'm thinking, you know, that's how I proved to myself that I know what I saw was real. I'm going to go out and capture it myself. I'm going to get it where I can show people and say, this is what I saw. Mm -hmm. And so that basically was how I got born into it. (laughs) And, uh, of course, the first team that I joined up with was, I I won't even go there. It was was (laughs) bad. It was bad. And, uh... Then my daughter and my son-in-law kind of did a little stuff ourselves there for a little bit. Then, uh, quite by accident, my daughter and my grandson was walking down the road and Dusty happened to stop and give them a ride and she, somehow the subject came up and she said, oh, my dad's into that. Well, he gave them his phone number and told her to, to give it to me and I called him. We met up and after that, it was all history. Oh, wow. So... That's how Half Past Dead got born, so to speak. Well, that, and that's just by that sheer coincidence, so to speak, it all came about. That's, that's yeah, awesome. and it, it all came together, and we we've been doing this him and I probably for three years now. And uh, well, actually, I know it's been three years, but uh, off and on all together, I've probably tinkered around with it for about twelve, but. It didn't get really, I guess, real until we hooked up, you know, and got our team going and everything because nobody, everybody is interested, but nobody's loyal, you know, I mean, when it gets down to it. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that, you know, and like I said, they go on one investigation, you don't get anything, you ain't going to hear from them no more. Right. And then finding serious investigators that are willing to commit the time and effort. And exactly. And and you've got some that want to investigate because that's exciting. Right. But when it comes to the hours of review, mm-hmm. they can't. they got to work or they got this going on or they got that going on, you know. Right. And that's, that's something that most teams run into. And it's hard because, you know, review. I I tell people all the time that you can figure for for every camera, or and, and this is factoring in multiple cameras on each investigation. Right. You know, you're right. If you're running a DVR, you got you know, you've got hours of of DVR video. You've got your your handheld video. You got your how many recorders you're running, and you know, by the time you get through all this stuff, you you put a good day into it anyway, if not more. Right. <coughs> right. I, I I usually tell people that for every hour of audio or video, that you can expect about roughly three hours to review it. Because you're having to, it, if you think you see something, you have to go back, rewind yeah, it, if, review it. Or if you think you heard something, you got to go back, you got to mark it, and then you got to, you know, and by the time you get through 
your audio recorder, you know, you've done spent two or three hours right there. Exactly, exactly. And good because just one hour of audio, you know, you, you hear something, you're not <laughs> sure if, you know, you think it might have been an EVP, but you want to go back you're, and you've listened to it time and time again, and you want to make sure that it's not the wind or it's not something that can be explained. So you're listening to the segment before and what's going on there, what's Bye. going up to it. And yeah, it, it definitely, um, you know, gets time consuming very fast. So it will eat you up. And <laughs> it will. that's what I'm saying. Nobody wants to put that time in. You know, everybody wants to, to do the investigating and everything, you know, the exciting part. And then once that's done, you know, they're done until the next one. Then they're ready to go. When are we going, when are we going to investigate now? Right, right. And um, I, what would you say um, has been probably the hardest thing about getting a team together would you say it was maybe getting the equipment going or you know well it, usually when somebody comes in they don't have anything okay they won't have a recorder they won't have a camera they won't have anything and uh, you know I tell people you know when, when they start talking about all this well I want to you know I want to join a team and do that. I said, well, uh, go get your recorder. At least have a recorder when you show up. You know, if nothing else, have a recorder. And uh, <laughs> one guy, we actually have one guy that did. He went and got him a recorder and stuff. And he had a, a little digital camera and stuff. And he actually turned out to be fairly decent. And then he up and disappeared. And... Uh, then he messaged me on Facebook one day and says, uh, I'd, I'd like to come back and, and, and do this again, you know. I said, what happened to you last time? Where did you go, you know? And uh, if you did come back, you know, how long are you going to be here this time? Right. right. And um, and there's always the, <laughs> you know, the not knowing. You know, there's some investigations. You may be there overnight. Some it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe several nights, and, and yeah, and we picked up. Uh, we have one female teammate, and me and Dusty, and that's that's our team right now. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, somebody joins in with us, but most time it's us three. And we picked her up on an investigation. Actually, oh. we were investigating at a friend of hers' house, and uh, <laughs> she showed up. And of course, you know, she's there watching what's going on. She's like, I've always wanted, you know, been interested in this. And so I got talking to her, and I said, "Well, I said, why don't you help us a little bit here and see what, what, how you like it, what you think, you know?" So she went, you know, we took turns doing EVP stuff with her, and she was actually pretty good. And uh, so after that, you know, she just joined up with us, and she's been the one that stuck with us, you know, through thick and thin. So. Well, that that's good. It, it's interesting the way that you meet certain people and you pick up people for your team and how that all comes about you know like like you were like you'd mentioned before you know how how you'd met dusty uh, from him giving your daughter and her husband a ride that's no, her and my grandson oh her and your grandson that um you know how you know just by that sheer coincidence uh, so so it it is amazing you know and, and a lot of times in in I preach this to people because I know from experience, you know, don't pick family members to be on your team. Right. You know, I mean, it's okay if they are, but I'm just saying, as a rule, don't go looking for your family members to be on your team. They'll be the least loyal ones in the whole bunch and expect you to understand every time they tell you they can't go because, you know, the cat died or whatever, you know. Uh, and not knocking anybody if you got a cat, but <laughs> just form of speech. Uh, you know, they'll make up the, the weirdest, silliest little excuses why they can't why they can't go or Right. 
And yeah. then you got the ones, and I got I got to bring this up because this happened to us on this last one we did where the snake was. This other guy that wanted to join up with us, well, he came on that investigation with us, and the whole time, well, I can't say the whole time, but ninety five percent of the time that we were there, he was constantly on the phone because his wife was texting him. You done oh, yet? No. Y'all done yet? Done yet? <laughs> that would drive me I would have to go into that would drive me nuts <laughs> I'm not kidding but my wife don't do that She she's pretty good about it she you know she doesn't like that I do it but she doesn't try to stop me from doing it and she doesn't hinder me when I'm doing it but this woman was texting him every two minutes, and I'm not even kidding. Wow. And uh, so when we, when I told you about we stopped at McDonald's, we was talking. He rode with me, right? So he he couldn't go until I went. <laughs> and uh, we were we were up there. We were talking about. Well, he walked off over there by himself, and he was. I saw him doing the text and things, so I knew what was going on. He come up over, I said, Mama mad at you? Yeah. I said, well, I guess we better get you home, man. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll, I'll let everybody in on a little secret. You know, the whole thing about cell phones putting off EMFs, that, that, that's not really true. We That's just something we come up with about putting them on airplane mode and turning them off during investigations for people like that. <laughs> uh. I might be lying about that. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't normally turn off my phone in case an emergency happens because that's the only way they can reach me. But you know, I and but my wife won't call me, right? You know, unless something does go on, you know, or um, and normally other people don't call me late at night like that, so I don't worry too much about you know anybody calling or anything or interfering but <laughs> right well and, and one thing about it though is really when when you have to truly be mindful of of the cell phone is when, when it's really critical is like during EVP if it's going off or you know if you're taking EMF readings or something like that but outside of that it's not going to have much effect I mean, it's you know, cell phone in your pocket's not going to affect a picture that you take or exactly. what's on your camera. Well, heck, I even use mine to take pictures sometimes. Right. Right. So, so you know, I see. I have seen some people that were overly militant about the no cell phone policy, but right. You know, you have to use common sense. You know. Well, I mean, you 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 do things respectful to the rest of the people on your team and to mm -hmm. you know. The client that you're, if you're at a client's house or whatever, you know, you you try to be respectful with, with the phones and all that stuff. Like I said, I don't turn mine off because if emergency come up, they couldn't get a hold of me. Right. But other than that, I'm not constantly texting back and forth, you know, or you know, my wife texts to me, "You done yet?" <laughs> right, right. I haven't seen you post many selfies from investigations on Facebook. <laughs> 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 so so you you have to work on that <laughs> yeah right um i don't have a lot of pictures on there um i don't do selfies that much <laughs> i mean you know I, i'd hate for somebody to look at my picture on their computer screen and crack or something like that but... <laughs> So, so just do somebody else's. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, and, and it's like when you go on one of those dating sites, mm -hmm. you know, and you find a picture of like, uh, uh, what was the guy uh, that was holding up the planet? You know who I'm talking about? Oh yeah. Um... And they used to do the thing. Don't be a 97 pound weekly. <laughs> and it showed the Atlas. Yes. So with a big body build, you you put a picture like that on there, you know. <laughs> you said to him, yeah, this is. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Atlas, yeah, see, Brian said Atlas, yeah, he knew what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. So, um, well, we don't have a whole lot of time left, so um, 
Do, do you have any events coming up or um, uh, something like that? that? Not really. We uh, now we've been talking about trying to set up to do a uh, a little event up here at the Walmart and everything to uh, collect for Wounded Warriors Project, and hopefully we're going to get that thing going. Uh, we're going to wait till spring hits when it's warm, where we can sit outside there, you know, and we're going to do a little thing to to hopefully collect for them guys because they really do need it and it's really awesome. sad when you think about how our veterans are treated nowadays you know I know it this ain't paranormal but you know I, I see so much going on with this it just ticks me off and uh, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the, the 90 year old veteran that they arrested twice for feeding the homeless down in yes. Florida that just burns me up you know, yes. I mean, you just want to go down there and grab this mayor by the nap of the neck, smack him around a little bit and say, what's wrong with you, fool? Right. I, I agree. All the things going on in the world, and he's worried about that. It... Right. You know, when you think about it, asylums and all that stuff were originally built as poorhouses. Mm -hmm. And that's where they would put the poor people who had no means to take care of themselves and they would, you know, feed them and, and they had a roof over their head. Why can't they do that now instead of making a law like that? Well, if you feed a homeless person, I'm going to arrest you. Mm -hmm. That's, and, and to me, that's that's absolutely ridiculous. I, I, I can't imagine any town, regardless of size, that doesn't have problems with theft, some type of drug use, some, some type of actual criminal activity that they're worried about a 90 year old veteran feeding homeless people exactly but, but we're reading about it in the news and, and that's that's ludicrous to me you know uh prison inmates have tvs coffee pots uh, you name microwaves probably and everything else in their daggum cells but you can't feed a homeless person because that's against the law right there's something bad wrong with that picture I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree, and and that's one thing that I I really respect about you and your team is how how much you do support the veterans. I I respect that one hundred percent. As a well, veteran you got to think. You know, the reason why we're able to do this show and everything right here and right now is because there's people out there in uniform protecting us and giving us that right. That's right. So, you know, if not for them, none of this stuff wouldn't be possible. I absolutely agree. And if the way things are going with, uh, and I won't even mention his name, <laughs> uh, we'll be lucky if we don't have a, a king slash dictator before the next few years is up. <laughs> it makes you wonder sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, enough political stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and next we're going to talk about religion. No. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, um... And, and Buddha. Right. <laughs> and, um, if someone wants to um, get in touch with your team or find out some more information about you, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? We have a website at www com. Okay, and I know y'all are on Facebook as and well. And we have the page on Facebook, Half Past Dead Paranormal Investigations on Facebook. Uh, I have a community on Google+, Plus, Half Past Dead Paranormal Unity on Google+. Plus. And, and you, um... And, and the Half Past Dead Paranormal Radio page on Facebook and the radio channel on YouTube. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And, um, and and you've got that. And one thing that, you know, that I truly respect, too, is, you know, you're, you're one of those people that are out there. You're all about peri unity, working together with other teams. And, and that's how it should be. Yes, Yes, that's what it's all about. So, there's too many people that are in the paranormal field for the wrong reasons, 
and that is they want to be number one so that a TV network will know the summer they'll get to be famous and make a lot of money. Absolutely. You know, it's not about helping a client. It's not about uh, getting the evidence, you know, proving the fact that what we already know is out there is out there. It's all about looking good for the network. Well, you can't do that if you're inviting all these other teams in with you because they might steal your glory, you know? Right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, you know, with me, it's about unity. I'm, I'm about, uh, and I will work with any team, anywhere, anytime, if I can get there. Right. <laughs> and that that's one of those things that we don't see enough of. So, so we, we appreciate it the people that, like you that are out there so well and people like you now so you know you toot your own horn I don't mind <laughs> <laughs> well you know I, you know it, it's like I tell people uh, about, about the show is I try to bring people on that you know are doing things right out there and you know that's why we bring the people like you out there that you know we're setting a good example and hopefully People coming into the field will follow and work together and learn from each other. And you, know. you got to watch, and, and I'm going to mention this because it happened to me recently. Uh, there are people out there who will trash you, run your name in the ground uh, for whatever reasons. Maybe their mama didn't spank them enough when they were a kid. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, I had this this group called OSB, which is. Uh, one step beyond paranormal skeptical research is what they go by. Mm -hmm. They did a podcast, and they didn't know me from Adam, but they found out that I was friends with a couple of people they didn't like. Right. So they did a podcast where they trashed me up really bad, uh, and the name of the podcast was Southern Fried Paranormal, mm -hmm. which was meaning me because I'm a Southern country boy. Right. And you got to, you know, I'm going to continue doing what I do. I'm not going to let that eat my lunch. So, you know, really they wasted a lot of time. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, for people out there, if that happens to you, don't, don't worry about it because people like that are just ignorant. And it's probably because they can't do it themselves and they're jealous of the people that do. I, I agree. Um we we had a similar experience, and it it happened um, oh about, about a year ago. Um, th this was from a group called Worst Paranormal. And, <laughs> that name ought to change something. Right, right. Um, and, and if you know, th this came right after there was a there was a local newspaper that did an article about us. And it went nationwide. It, you know, it hit the Washington Times, and you know, went all over the country. Um, last, I think the final count was it went something like 107 newspapers that I knew of, and that's awesome. Yeah, it 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 went all over, and you know, hit countless websites and everything. So you know, we we got a lot of attention, and it was for something positive. It, it was one of those articles, hey, we've got this group, they're doing this, and, you know, it was really positive. Right. And, you know, immediately after that, we got, they, they wrote this big thing on us saying that we were fake and all of this. And, yeah, see, that's exactly what they were doing to me. Right. And, and of course, I, you know, they said that they had investigated our evidence, and so the only thing that I asked them is, well, when did you investigate it? No one ever contacted us or examined our evidence. You looked at our site, but you never actually investigated it. You're just making these claims. And for everyone that they asked, all I simply did was sent people straight to their site for them to read the article for themselves. And right. that, that proved my argument in, its, in itself. And so to people that come across those type of things it if you look at the you know if you listen to the podcast or you look at the articles and it doesn't take very long to see the motives behind exactly why they're, 
talking about the other teams. Now, yeah. see, these people got thrown out of Rolling Hills mm-hmm. Asylum. They got thrown out of Iron Island Museum because of the way they do things. Right. You know, which is not ethical. Mm-hmm. Well, so then they get ticked off, and what do they do? They go do a podcast and trash places like Iron Island, and I know those people are a great bunch of guys. And uh, Linda that, that owns that place up there, she's, she's really good. And they do a lot of stuff to benefit their community and stuff like that. You know, they're not bad people. But they trashed them because they acted like ignorant morons and they got through out. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing you deal with. Exactly. So, so any kind of information that's out there, and especially... When it comes to something like that, you always have to consider the source. Exactly. So, but anyway, I I certainly do appreciate you coming on the show tonight, Roger. I, I've really enjoyed it. Oh, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. I, I, I think me and you could sit here and talk for hours. I would get to talk to too many people about the invisible snake. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the highlight of of my night I'm going to tell you uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's something you tell your grandkids about man we wrestled a 15 foot invisible anaconda out of my house one time <laughs> definitely the um, inma- inmate ghost killed it for us <laughs> right good, good thing you had the inmates go sleep yeah right, right. good thing just, uh, he follows me everywhere I said good thing you had him around <laughs> right right if he, if he was still locked up y'all, y'all would probably be <laughs> yeah. owners <laughs> yeah, it's fake with a guy. <laughs> so, so anyway, and, and I'm gonna go ahead and tell you. I, I hope I can get you on the show again real soon. I would enjoy that very much. We had a big time. I had a lot of fun. And you guys, if you know, if you want to tune in, I'm on every Monday night at seven Eastern till ten Eastern. So, awesome. come and check us out. We have a lot of fun on there, too. We, we talk about paranormal, and, and, and we have a laugh or two. We just have a good time, and we're all laid back. So <laughs> come check us out. Definitely. Well, everybody, thanks for tuning in, and we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. And thank you, Roger, and everyone have a good night. Good night, y'all. Thank you for listening to Paranormal Tees and Ponderings with the Casper Paranormal Team. Brought to you by the Paranormal King Radio Network. We hope you enjoyed the show. And we'll tune in again next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Please be safe as you're out there especially if you're investigating the paranormal. Take care. Have a good night and happy holidays. Thank you again from the Casper Paranormal.